Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'll just let some other people come in and take their seats. Thank you for being here. I think people are going to slowly filter in, but let's get going so we can uh, stay on time and have some time afterwards to mingle in the reception area. So good evening and welcome. My name is Joanna Kerr. I am a librarian here at this lovely central library here uh, at, um, I was going to say in downtown London, but you know where you are. I'm usually online. So. Um, I just want to say this time of year when so much is growing to really appreciate nature and the natural spaces that support us really leads to uh, gratitude and thanks for the uh, First Nations community, communities that surround London and um, just honoring and respecting the culture, languages, um, and heritage of these diverse First Nations. So I just want to take this moment to acknowledge that we are gathering on the treaty and traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, of the Chippewas, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. I'll slow down a bit. The Lenape of the Monsey Delaware Nation, also the treaty and traditional lands of the Oneida Nation, which is part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, so, a land acknowledgement is obviously just one step. Um, sorry, Jessica, could we raise the lights a little so that folks can find their seats? Sorry, just a little, mm, just a little help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, right. A land acknowledgement is really just a first step in, um, in our own reflection on uh, our awareness and next steps for us to take uh, in relation to reconciliation. So let me tell you what's going to happen tonight. We're going to start with hearing from Jay Stanford from the City of London, and our featured speaker, Karen Farbridge, will then join us, followed by Milfred Hammerbacher and Mayor Josh Morgan. We're going to have our panel discussion then, and what we'll do afterwards at 8.30 is uh, go back to our reception area for a little mingle time, and On The Move Organics is going to be with us as well if you wanted to get any other drinks or snacks at that time. So with that, uh, a big thank you to On The Move Organics, a big thank you to our ushers, to our AV techs as well, and of course, Green in the City, this being our final uh, event in a long series of events in this series. Um, thank you so much to our Green in the City partners, uh, um, the City of London, as well as the London Environmental Network. So thanks so much to all the folks that made this possible through many meetings and uh, work and events. So, um, oh, a quick little note too, um, if you parked your car in the City Plaza lot tonight, just grab a parking pass for any of our ushers or from me um, and um, you'll be good to go. Um, and that's it for that. So let's, let's get into it. I'm going to introduce Jay Stanford. He's going to give a little talk first, as I said. So Jay Stanford is the Director of Climate Change, Environment, and Waste Management for the City of London. In this role, he oversees initiatives and programs related to environmental sustainability, waste management, climate action, and community engagement. His work focuses on making London more resilient and environmentally conscious. Now, I will welcome Jay Stanford to the stage. Okay, then I probably. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you uh, for joining us here tonight. I'll tell you, under these lights, I can hardly see you, so I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I am actually so lucky to be here because I'm talking about something that I've been involved in for so many years with so many good colleagues and so many good community members. It's just wonderful to actually be your opening act here for about 10, 12 minutes. So bear with me because we're going to talk about a few things. On the screen right now, how worried are people out there in Canada when it comes to climate change? Some polls over the last 10 months have suggested, what do we see here, about 60%, as high as 72%. That 72 was probably very closely aligned with some of the challenges we saw across Canada last year to do with climate change and the impacts in a number of different Canadian provinces. So you look at that and you say, okay, about two thirds are worried or very worried. You then look at these numbers from two polls last year. 60% believe individuals need to act now and do their part to combat climate change. And in September, 66% agree, everyone, if everyone made small changes, it would make a big impact. So what have we learned about that for London. Well, 
I'm sure that from a statistical point of view, I'm, I'm breaking about every, raw, uh, every rule possible, but let's just say two-thirds apply to London. So you take that across our population and you say there's about 275,000 people that are either worried or very worried or wish to take action. We know that some are, many aren't. But when you worry about something, one of the best ways to remove that worry is to take action. So in London two years ago, the Climate Emergency Action Plan was approved. It had a lot of community engagement, a lot of involvement to help develop it, and then it went through implementation. We've produced one progress report, we've produced one update report, and we do measure this. And the overall measurement program is really in five big areas. About 200 actions, dealing primarily with things coming out of the city, and many, many service areas involved. A number of the folks in those service areas here tonight with us. Number two is all about people and all about the community action, as well as businesses. Number three, other levels of government. Uh, we see a little bit of activity outside. Tonight's all about what we do locally, though. Number four, greenhouse gas. We'll dive deeper into that. And of course, we talked about already the weather impact, severe weather. That is, those are the things that we talk about here in London. Each one has different meaning to different people. A deeper dive on greenhouse gas production is fascinating because it begins to highlight the key areas of action. What you see in the dotted red line, you and I basically, actions that are required to reduce the way we live, and of course our personal vehicle is a big part of the biggest bar. That amount is about 50%, meaning you and I control a lot of what we do with respect to climate change. You add up all the red bars and we look at the transportation sector and you quickly see 40% of our greenhouse gases are associated with that. The mobility master plan is gonna work on a portion of those, but not everything. A lot of that movement deals with going to and from London, those planes people hop on, you name it. So at least to take action, you've got a good base of measurement. And then we look at this curve on our road to net zero by 2050, an area that's been selected by many municipalities in North America. And we look here first at our residential sector, holding its own, knowing that a lot of this deals with actions taken by the provincial government to clean the grid years ago. So we're still seeing the benefits of that. But overall, we're trending in the right direction. We now roll in active and closed landfill sites in London. We roll in the sewage treatment plant and we see it's holding its own. It's heading downwards, exactly where we should be. Roll in the next sector, the industrial, commercial and institutional, following that trend line. But here's where we begin to go in a direction that has to be corrected. We bring in the transportation sector and you just see what's happening there. It is the challenging area not just for London, I'll tell you across North America, everyone has to put a bigger dent into this. But the solutions are there. It is the willingness to implement and it's the willingness for people to change behavior. So that can be done. Changing behavior. So I'm gonna do one more deep dive here, folks. Climate action by people, by businesses. And I'm gonna, I'll tell you, I can't hug everyone, but action taken by people, by the community, by businesses. I'm wearing my green coat for a reason. A lot of you are wearing green. That signifies action right there on its own. The groups you see, the events you see on the screen are just from late January of this year to the point in time right now to what occurred just last week with the London Environmental Network and Green Economy London, what's going to occur with EarthFest this Saturday, and the other events just scheduled in the very, very near future. I love brand marks because these things have been around for a while and they're driven by people and businesses. And action is occurring, occurring across London. Perhaps not as fast as some people like, but we have action, we have real life examples. Home energy efficiency, it goes through spurts, often driven by incentives at different levels of government. Uh, but I'll tell you, you look around, you see what's occurring on the screen, different types of things. Air source, air source heat pumps at work, solar panels occurring right here in London. On the path to a net zero home, well, maybe, 
Not everyone will get there. You don't have to. But you have to get down that path. You have to make those purchasing decisions at the right time. The sooner you make them, the better off you will be and we will all be. And there are going to be net zero homes built. And along the way, there's going to be net zero ready homes built. Other action. The transportation system. You, I don't even have to tell you why it's important. I just showed you. But there are things occurring. There is that positive movement here in London. I take advantage of it quite often. What you see on the screen is of no surprise to many of you in the room. We need more people using it. This one may be a bit of a surprise. Not everyone knows car share is alive and well here in London. It went through a soft period, but is going through a rebuild. All communities are rebuilding with their car share network. So that's right here in London right now. This program, this one's launched by the City of London, designed for employees and employers, and it's all about revisiting the past. We used to have a carpool program. We used to have a few of these things. They disappeared under COVID. Time to reinvigorate them. We have now call it, are calling it Smart Commute London. Why? Because we've joined a family of communities around the greater Toronto area, and we grabbed all their information. What a better way. We've grabbed their tools. We're bringing them to London right now. We've already had one or two businesses sign up, and I'm hoping after tonight we have a flurry of businesses because many of you are either a business or an employee of a business that can take advantage of this. Ad adaptation. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, when it comes to flooding, we know that well in London. Uh, and we also know that there's things people can do that are low cost. And there's advantages to some of these protection for overland flow of water, and as well the advantage of creating a rain garden and creating some natural habitat right on your own property. Good things happen when you just think things through and say, I'm going to spend 500 bucks. Can I spend it differently to help the environment and adapt and make my property more resilient? Uh, we've got some personal experience on this one. I think many of you might have it as well, too. Let's protect our homes. Flooding is going to get worse, unfortunately, because the weather is getting worse. We've seen that. We're not the only city in this category. Protecting yourself, make yourself more resilient. I'm going to end with this because I'm probably running out of my warm-up act time. Food waste. And why am I raising this? Because it's connected to so many things we do because we eat every day. But we often take too many things for granted. So yes, the green bin's here, and I'll come back to that at the end, because that is only part of the answer. It's first understanding why. So what we generate, on average, in London and elsewhere in Canada, is about 35% by weight of our materials, either in a green bin or in the garbage, is food waste. Of that 35%, two-thirds is avoidable food waste, that half-eaten sandwich. And I know a few of you are saying, Jay, you've told me this before. I'm telling you it again because I want you to tell your neighbor. Because your neighbor's not getting it if you are. So you take that information and you say, look, what's the value of that? Well, this represents $1,000 per household of wasted and avoidable food. Multiplying that across households, the wastage is enormous in this community. A community that could use that money. Who couldn't, you know, let's face it, save 10%. That keeps 10 to $12 million in your pockets that you can invest in climate action. You can invest in other needs in the community. You can invest in the future. And why is all that important? Because food waste is part of a food distribution system that represents a third of the world's greenhouse gases. So when you eat, be well aware of what's going on locally and globally. It all matters. My last slide. You know, those three words are so important to me because it, it's, it's kind of the way I, I, I lived most of my life. I love to celebrate and have a good time. I love to encourage and I love to inspire when I can. Why? Because all that positivity leads to more and more positive actions. So Joanna, those, there's my opening remarks. Thank you. Jay. Terrific. Right. And I'm here to welcome uh, Karen up. So I'm just going to quickly move to 
this here. Great. Okay. So, um, yes. Great start, Jay. Thanks so much. So, let me introduce Dr. Karen Farbridge. She is the president of Karen Farbridge and Associates. She has over 30 years of experience in promoting sustainability at the local level, including 17 years in municipal politics, 11 of them as mayor of Guelph. Partnering with York University, she has worked with over 100 municipal planners and officials in Ontario, New Brunswick, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba to promote the integration of climate and energy policies into land use planning. More recently, Karen's focus has transitioned to implementation to advance innovations in governance, retrofit business models, and municipal secondary planning. Karen is the chair of Quest Canada, a national nonprofit organization supporting community climate action across Canada. Karen was awarded Canada's Clean 16 Award in 2015 and again in 2024 for her work advancing climate change action and sustainability. We are very happy to have Karen Farbridge with us here today. Come on up. Good evening, everyone. Oops. No slides up there yet, but perhaps they're coming. I didn't look behind me. I should have looked. I should have looked behind me instead of just down. There we go. That's a little better. Okay. There we go. Sorry. About Thank that. you. <laughs> no problem. So thank you, Jay uh, and Joanne, for the, the introduction. Um, uh, a little over five years ago, I was invited to your community to speak about climate change and community energy planning as part of this event. And so thank you very much for inviting me back to be, um, uh, to be a small part of your journey again and, and to share some observations about some of the challenges and opportunities for climate, local climate action. So back then, I believed act local, um, think global. And so I believe that just as much uh, today, five years later. I really do believe that Canada's towns and cities must be actively engaged in the in energy transition to a low carbon economy. If not, I think our, our, our country will continue to struggle to make the changes that will be necessary at the scale and the pace required to meet our national emissions target. And full engagement of communities, I think, is our best chance of a just and democratic uh, a transition. Globally, the energy transition is accelerating, which is good news. Uh, the question is whether it can happen quickly enough to make an, a difference on climate change. Uh, so our towns and cities can't, simply can't afford to be passive bystanders or worse barriers to the change that is coming, because this energy transition is very local. The infrastructure to produce and distribute energy in our incumbent energy system, which is predominantly comprised of electricity, natural gas, and transportation fuels, is very different from the infrastructure that will be needed in the future, from harnessing and distributing local renewable energy sources to how we design and build our communities to reduce energy demand. From energy production to energy end use, our current linear system and centralized energy system generates considerable energy waste and pollution. And so local solutions offer us a different future. So this is a really strong message for me that I keep coming back to. Don't waste energy, make it useful. Don't waste food, make it useful, coming <laughs> from Jay's slides. I'm impressed by the solid foundation your community has built. You are informed, you have measured your baseline energy use and emissions, you know your starting point, you know where and how you use energy and where your emissions come from. You've established a vision and targets for where you want to be and, and by when. You use science to guide your decision making, You've been honest, you understand the risks of not acting, you've been transparent about what it's gonna to take to change course, and you've started to act. And you remain accountable by monitoring your progress and regularly reporting to the community, and that, that trend slide was really instructive. 
It takes time to build a solid foundation, and sometimes that can feel very frustrating. But sometimes the right course of action is to go slow, to go fast, if you want to sustain action over the long run. I remember when our water conservation and efficiency strategy came to Guelph City Council 25 years ago, a long time, um, a delegation that evening, a local environmental group, spoke against the strategy and the recommendation to develop a five-year plan. They didn't believe we needed any more planning. We didn't need to spend more time on that. We just needed a toilet retrofit program. And so I understood their impatience. They had been working in the trenches for many years to protect local water resources. However, 25 years later, that initial strategy continues to serve as a vital foundation to sustain action. It supported successive five-year action plans that successfully decoupled water consumption from uh, growth in our community. And yes, the first five-year plan included a toilet retrofit program, but much more. Your community has built a, a, this, a similar foundation for community energy planning and local climate action. Your local government is playing a key municipal role as a facilitator, building the community's capacity to grow the market for low carbon and high efficiency technologies and practices. Leading by example in their corporate activities, the City of London plays another key role to grow the market as an implementer. And by integrating energy and climate policies into land use policies and infrastructure decisions, your local government is lo leveraging its role as a regulator to steer the market with clear rules that direct activities and, and investments towards a low carbon future. You need a solid foundation to sustain action. But it's also true that you can look very busy on climate-related activities without having the impact we urgently need. You, like many uh, towns and cities across Canada, are coming to the same conclusion. Despite all the hard work over the last decade or more, it's simply not enough. Like you, they're asking, how do we scale our impact? We're all entangled in an energy system that backstops our economy, our quality of life, our modern way of living, but is simultaneously hurting the planet and our children's future. We know we have to change individual behaviors, but those behaviors arise from the systems in which our society operates. Untangling this complexity will take considerable courage and creativity, both of which I think are readily found at the local level. So three quarters of Canada's energy use is derived from fossil fuels. And over 80% of Canada's emissions come from our use of energy. And more than half of those emissions are influenced locally. So if we want to move the dial on reducing emissions, we need to double down on some big rocks. You're likely familiar with this metaphor um, for focusing on the priorities that must be accomplished to achieve a goal. As an example, the federal government tackled a big rock when it passed regulations to phase out coal-fired electricity generation. And Jake commented on the impact that had um, in our province of Ontario, which was a leader in that. Coal is a more carbon-intensive fuel than natural gas. It has more carbon content per unit of energy and releases twice as many greenhouse gas emissions. So it was a clear big rock and very controversial at the time when it was done. And still is today across the country, but progress is being made. During my presentation, I, I want to focus on three big rocks that I consistently see that, that communities are struggling and, and, and putting their efforts to work on. So the first is space heating, and then personal mobility, which um, has been raised as an issue in, of concern in your community, and then home energy retrofits. So in Canada, space and water heating accounts for almost 80% of a building's emissions. So it's a big rock. In London, space and water heating accounts for approximately 40% of your com community's emissions. Again, evidence that it's a big rock to be able to tackle. So how will we decarbonize space heating and stay warm in a cold country? 
For, mil for millennia, indigenous peoples used wood as an energy source for additional warmth, as did early European settlers. In the 19th century, Canada began to transition away from firewood to fossil fuels, although not as quickly as other industrializing countries. Between 1870 and 1950, coal was used by more people for more reasons than any other fuel. However, firewood remained an important fuel for heating and cooking for many Canadians well into the 20th century, largely because of the proximity of our vast forests. While the price gap between coal and firewood began to close in cities like Toronto and Montreal by the end of the 19th century, firewood was less expensive for rural and small town Canadians. And it wasn't until the 1950s when firewood consumption began to materially decline as consumers turned to less expensive and more convenient oil and gas furnaces for warmth. And so by the 1960s, most Canadians used fossil fuels to heat their homes. I share this history to highlight two things. First, this is a relatively recent and rapid energy transition from fuel wood to fossil fuels. Second, despite the speed at which fossil fuels have displaced historical sources of energy globally, the timing and rate of transition has varied regionally with traditional resources, uh, energy sources persisting much longer in some places than others, and still to this day. Regional factors, geographic, political, economic, cultural, social, can either accelerate or slow down an energy tr transition, and this has also been true in Canada. They don't stop it, they slow it down or they accelerate it. Understanding these factors are helpful reflections as we lean into the modern energy transition. Not only will there be regional factors this time, there will be more local factors accelerating or slowing down the energy transition because it's so much locally based. So how will you decarbonize space and water heating in London? More energy efficient homes will get you part of the way there, but what is your, long, your community's long-term heat plan? Every community is gonna need one. How will you scale the success of local innovators and early adopters in your community in this regard? You have some great local examples. I'm gonna share just a few stories about how some Canadian com communities are tackling this big rock. So the first one is in Waterloo Region. So space and water, uh, and water heating is the largest source of emissions after transportation in Waterloo Region, and most of it is supplied by natural gas. Not surprising, the same would be here. Natural gas burns at a very high temperature, almost 2,000 degrees Celsius. And while high temperatures are required for certain industrial activities, space and water heating can be efficiently provided by low-grade sources of heat, less than 70 degrees Celsius. Electrification is one pathway to decarbonize space heating. However, we need electricity for multiple purposes, and that list is quickly growing. Analysts suggest a doubling or tripling of electricity infrastructure in less than 30 years. Such a massive infrastructure program would come with significant technical challenges, public resistance, and costs. While some space in water heating in Waterloo Region will undoubtedly be best supplied by electricity, they began to ask where might they source low carbon thermal energy in their community? Pretty much everywhere. It's in the ground, it's in the air, heat is released into the environment from buildings, industry, and all manner of human activities. Yet in Canada, we pay very little heat, uh, heed to this. Harnessing low th local thermal energy sources is simply overlooked by central en centralized energy planning, and we're only beginning to grasp its potential in our country. Waterloo Region has started to map local sources of renewable thermal energy. They're identifying the market solutions, the policies, the infrastructures, the infrastructure that would be required to harness it and distribute it to homes and buildings. The region recognizes that by understanding the value of the thermal energy assets, and every community has them, the municipal and utility leaders will be better informed when making 
decisions about future energy investments. Brampton is another community also taking steps to decarbonize space and water heating. Natural gas for heating buildings in Brampton contributes 38% of their emissions, similar to yours. The Heritage Heights community in northwest Brampton is the city's last remaining unplanned greenfield and is expected to house approximately 124,000 people, which is a small city. The secondary plan for this development includes several sustainability and climate, climate objectives, including achieving a net zero community. They recognize they didn't have time to retrofit this in the future. They had to make the change today. So for low density residential areas, which is detached homes and townhouses, this means the installation of air sourced heat pumps and supplemental electric heat. So no retail natural gas is planned for these areas. For medium and high density mixed use areas, this means meeting the heating and hot water needs of buildings using district energy services. Natural gas may be used as a transitional fuel to start, which will still deliver lower emissions than the traditional path, but the distribution network will facilitate the use of many kinds of low carbon thermal energy sources in the future. So air sourced heat pumps, I think you're well familiar with. They've been well popularized by federal incentive programs. Um, uptake by homeowners and the development industry is, is increasing quickly. Modern district energy systems are globally recognized as an effective pathway to decarbonize energy for urban heating. While not new to Canada, the first system to distribute heat through underground pipes was built right here in London in 1880. Their use is limited compared to other parts of the world because of regional factors. While early systems use fossil fuels to generate heat, modern systems have been designed to use low carbon thermal energy that's not technically or financially feasible at the scale of an individual building. So the next community is, is New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Interest in district energy systems in Canada is growing. A quarter of Canada's systems have been built in the last 10 years. New Glasgow, Nova Scotia is on the path to build another. It's a small community of 9,000 people. We often think about district energy as big urban-centered um, infrastructure, but this is a small community embarking on this. Buildings in, in their community contribute to over half of the town's emissions. And while they recognize that heat pumps are being promoted nationally as a technology to reduce emissions for space heating, in Nova Scotia, 50% of electricity comes from coal plants. So this means heat pumps are less effective for reducing emissions than in other regions, since electricity runs the heat pump. Electricity rates are also expected to rise significantly in Nova Scotia, making heat pumps a potentially expensive alternative there. So regional difference have a big impact in these, in these conversations. So the town has turned to an affordable, low carbon solution, district energy. The goal is to connect more than 90% of the buildings over approximately 10 years, and the system will use local biomass from managed forests with the potential to be actually net positive. Owned by the community, the system will take the load off the electricity grid, supporting the province's transition away from coal to renewable electricity, as well as the electrification of other sectors like transportation. It is an elegant local integrated solution to the energy transition and aligns well with the town's climate action plan. The town's goals also include stabilizing energy rates for customers while enhancing local energy security and resilience. And early economic analysis suggests that the cost of heat from the system for consumers would be lower than all alternatives, none of which are low carbon. And then finally, um, for space heating, um, the village, uh, Leelam Village in, in Vancouver. British Columbia is home to about a quarter of Canada's district energy systems, second only to Ontario. Leelam Village is a 22-acre mixed-use development in Vancouver. 
Led by the Musqueam First Nation, this master plan community will be home to 2,500 residents upon completion. Space and water heating is being supplied by a first of its kind paf passive district energy loop. By capturing and reusing all wastewater heat before it leaves the community, the energy loop has reduced the need for externally supplied uh, energy by 80%. So it's a great illustration of how much waste heat is released in our communities and the opportunity once we actually see it. So don't waste energy, make it useful. So let's move to um, a second big rock, personal mobility, and Jay, you raised this. So apparently, Canadians travel about 2,700 times the distance from the Earth to the sun every year. So that's, that's a pretty big rock for us to tackle as a country and a community. Personal mobility accounts for 14% of Canada's emissions and is the largest source of emissions in your community. Electrification will reduce the emissions associated with personal mobility. Globally, the electric vehicle market continues to show exponential growth. Consistent with other energy transitions, the pace of EV adoption varies regionally, both inside and outside of Canada, for a variety of reasons. But despite these regional differences, the transition is well underway, and local innovation will be key to its acceleration. Across Canada, there are numerous examples of collaborative municipal and regional strategies to increase charging availability and to ensure equitable access to the benefits of zero emission vehicles, which include better air quality and, and reduced noise. The public-private partnership to install charging stations in London a few years ago is an example of your government investing to grow the market for low carbon energy technologies. But this is only part of, the, the, of this rock. Um, looking to the future, how sustainable is this system for personal mobility that has evolved to be based on the personal automobile? So I'm going to go back to a little bit of history. Um, the replacement of horse-drawn carriages by motor cars for personal transportation occurred very rapidly after World War I. Before World War I, there were very few cars in the streets in Canada. Most people walked, cycled, used horse-drawn cabs, or electric trolleys for personal transportation. Only the wealthy in urban centers could afford their own horse and carriage. In rural areas, horse-drawn vehicles were common, but long-distance travel was still limited because it was too time-consuming. Few people traveled between cities, and when they did, it was by train. Regular daily personal travel was restricted to a few kilometers a day, as it had been throughout history. Anything further was considered a major trip. Goods and services were available locally. In 1910, there were less than 5,000 personal motor vehicles in Canada. Then their price began to drop quickly with the introduction of the moving assembly line. While the cost still represented a significant percentage of household incomes, the introduction of consumer credit, a financial innovation, meant the purchase of a car was suddenly in reach of an emerging middle class. Car registrations grew to over a million by 19, by, by, I've got 2030 here, so this was 1930. Almost half of Canadian households in 20 years owned a car. Within a short span of time, there were far more cars on the road than there ever had been horses and carriages, and a new term emerged, the traffic jam. It goes back to the 1930s. After World War II, this new system for personal mobility established deep roots in Canadian urban centers where most Canadians live today, providing daily access to employment, education, recreation, and goods and services. The system promoted the development of less dense suburban neighborhoods, the separation of residential, commercial, and industrial uses, and massive investments in road and parking infrastructure that con continues to grow. The personal motor vehicle offers many benefits, but in particular, it has meant we can travel longer distances in a shorter period of time. This is really important. 
According to historians, the average number of daily trips per person and the time we will allocate to traveling in a day shows remarkable stability throughout history and regardless of the mode of transportation available to us. Most personal travel begins and ends at home and people spend an average of one to two hours per day traveling. So fast forward to the 21st century and they're beginning to see signs that this system of personal mobility is becoming a victim of its own success in urban centers. When you include the time to earn, to earn the money to pay for the car, the fuel, the road infrastructure through your taxes and other related costs, the average effective or social speed of a car in Canada today has been estimated at 20 kilometers per hour. Now, see there's a warning up there. Um, I'm being deliberately provocative with this slide to make a point because this is not an apples to apples uh, comparison. But I, was, I recently read this research, came out of Alberta um, and, the city of, and the University of Calgary. I just found it very intriguing and, and a new way to look at this. So our main, our main system for personal mobility is under stress. And you, I mean, you've all spent too much time in traffic, I'm sure, at some point, which makes it vulnerable to disruption, not only by alternative modes of transportation, but other systems that destroy or reduce the need for this form of mobility, like a complete 15-minute community. And I recently listened to a podcast about how remote work um, can also play a role in this as well. The trick to challenging the dominance of our current system for personal mobility will be to replicate as many of the most beneficial features as possible of, of the dominant system. It will need to be affordable and quick while promoting personal freedom and autonomy. Perhaps that's why electric scooters have become so popular for certain urban demographics. And not everyone uses a car as their primary mode of transportation for a variety of reasons. So an energy efficient and climate friendly transportation system for personal mobility gives priority to accessible and affordable travel options for all users. Once again, it's gonna be local innovations that disrupt this system. And your mobility plan sets a foundation for that work. So last big rock. Nationally, the building sector is the third largest emitting sector after the oil and gas and transportation sectors. And most of our homes will be, still be lived in and used um, by 2050. So this sector is not only a big rock, but it's also proving to be a very hard rock to crack. Um, and Jay, you mentioned that there's action here, but just not enough yet. Technically, we could double the efficiency of existing homes in Canada. However, this is not a technology issue. We have yet to create the market for energy, home energy retrofits, despite decades of top-down government and utility programs and they keep coming. There are several bottom-up programs underway right now in Canada which show some promise, but much more needs to be done to create the right market conditions for their success. So what could that be? Well, for instance, mandatory home energy labeling, the disclosure of the energy performance of homes and buildings, just like what we'd have for the, appliance, for the appliances we buy, has been shown to transform the market for energy efficiency in other jurisdictions. The federal government committed eight years ago to work with provinces and territories to transition from our existing voluntary program to a mandatory program. And a growing number of municipal governments are developing home energy retrofit programs. So I can't help but think municipal advocacy right now for a mandatory home energy labeling program would help them continue to lead and accelerate their impact that they're trying to have in their communities. Much has changed in the five years since I last spoke to you, not least of which was a global pandemic, which I think continues to teach us things about ourselves um, and society that, that we did not know or had ignored or, or perhaps forgot. The Global Risk Report this year identifies extreme weather as the highest risk globally. 
with an, under, with an unnerving understory of AI misinformation and disinformation and increasing social and political polarization and geopolitical conflict. So there's lots of headwinds for the work that we're, we're trying to do here. For the last six years, I served as board chair of Meridian Credit Union, the largest credit union in Ontario and among the top four in Canada. And so this has provided me with a really a better understanding of how the financial sector and more broadly the corporate sector is responding to climate change. And it's given me some renewed hope. Capital is moving from high to low carbon investments. And behind this, trans behind this transition are three trends. One is increased rigor in climate disclosures so investors can have confidence in what is being reported and make informed investment decisions. And it was communities and municipalities that led disclosure work um, in the early years. Global harmonization of sustainability reporting standards and a shift from voluntary to mandatory disclosures, which is a lesson for home energy labeling. Will we still read stories of greenwashing and green wishing? Absolutely, but they're increasingly scandalous stories besides, precisely because of the rising international standards that are holding corporations accountable. So what does this mean for Canada's towns and cities? You will face many headwinds as you seek to scale your impact, especially as you work to tackle the big rocks. However, there are some new tailwinds coming your way, and now is the time to, to organize to catch them. For towns and cities like London you, who are serious about making a difference on climate change, it will be essential to identify the most effective ways to scale your impact. Energy transitions don't happen on their own, the result of human ingenuity and ambition. If local government and business leaders in southwestern Ontario, led by London Mayor Sir Adam Beck, had not worked together to bring Niagara Power to Ontario homes and businesses, electrification in Ontario would have taken a decidedly different path. The main economic drivers of past energy transitions has been to produce cheaper or better energy services. Those drivers exist today. We see the growth of cost-effective technologies for generating and distributing low-carbon energy locally. We see the convergence of digital and energy technologies and the growing systemic inefficiencies of a highly centralized incumbent energy system. However, the urgency to also reduce emissions demands considerably more focused coordination to accelerate the modern energy transition. So some parting words, which I think your community understands well. Be an enabler, not a passive bystander or worse, an obstacle to the energy transition. Make sure your community benefits and is not left behind. Actively engage energy policy makers and planners Ensure a just and democratic transition for your community. Promote local solutions overlooked by other levels of government or centralized energy planners. Ensure nothing, nothing is left off the table, again, for the benefit of your own community. Catch the tailwinds. They're precious, and you're going to need them. And finally, don't waste energy. Make it useful. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. So I'll just explain what's happening next. Um, we're going to have our panel, um, but first, I'm gonna introduce uh, the two other panel members that will be joining Karen to give uh, just a five minute introduction to their, um, to their reason for being here today, to their talk. And um, so I'm gonna start with uh, Milfred Hammerbacher. So I'll introduce Milford first. Um, as co-founder and chief executive officer of S2E Technologies, Inc., Milford and his team have played a key role in the development of West Five and are the developers of Eve Park in the Riverbend area of London. 
Before that, they built the largest solar factory in Canada at the time, partnered with Samsung to build the largest solar farms in Canada at the time, and developed or supplied over 800 megawatts of solar projects operating today. Milford has lived and managed businesses in four countries. He and his businesses have always focused on saving our planet. So I'm going to welcome Milford up to share a few, uh, a few minutes of his time here. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate everyone coming out here to, to listen to us tonight. Uh, uh, it, it was kind of interesting that uh, Karen was a keynote speaker because uh, I met Karen probably about 15 years ago, back when uh, we were looking for a site for a solar factory. And uh, the two finalist cities were Guelph and London. Karen won. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I didn't forget London. And, uh, you know, in that process of looking for a factory, we had some pretty specific things we were looking for, but the main thing we were looking for is a city that gets it, that recognized there is a climate change problem and that we can all do something about it. And so that's how, a couple years later, we ended up here in London and, uh, me and a few crazy uh, uh, professors had this idea, man, if we could just find a developer that would take a look at developing a community differently, um, it would be a great learning experience for their students, and maybe we could make uh, some difference. And so that was the odyssey. We came to London, um, the economic development group here, um, Heather Pilot, I remember her name still, um, introduced me to a lot of developers here in London, and I got to admit, it was pretty depressing at first. I uh, got a lot of doors uh, that didn't open and uh, some that closed shortly after meeting me. But I met this guy named Richard Sifton, and you know he's still not been honest with me yet, but I think he thought, well, I'm just going to humor this guy. He'll go away. And he said, yeah, I've got this piece of property in uh, West London. Show me what you guys can do. Give me your utopian uh, concept. And so that's how West Five was born almost uh, 10, you know, 11 years ago. Um, and probably still one of the greatest periods of my career. Because what we did is we worked with about 13 universities and colleges across Canada. We hired 90 PhD students, co-op students, um, and, and develop this concept in a pretty short period of time. And to do anything in a short period of time in academia, I know we got some academia here, that's not always an easy thing to do, but it was just an amazing project that they did. And so West Five uh, uh, was born. And so really, I've got some really good news and I've got some bad news. Uh, the good news is, is that the technology exists today to do many things uh, towards solving our climate change problem and to do it economically, um, and it's here today. And West Five, um, and later on Eve Park, uh, the project that my company's developed in the West Five area, are, are great examples of what can be done with technology and with the right kind of partners that we found here in London. You know, it just, you, you can't do things um, in a silo. It takes a lot of team effort. Um, one of the key uh, things in London is um, you guys, I, I hope you realize you have probably one of the most progressive utilities in Ontario, if not the country, um, Vinay Sharma. Um, and so when you're talking about energy, that hydro is a critical part of it. So he was one of the first guys that I met that said, I'm all for it. We met with the city. We had the city manager at the time bring in all of the, the department heads and, uh, and you know Richard and I explained, here's what we're gonna do and guess what? We're probably gonna do things differently so please just have an open mind. And, and the city was very receptive to that um, and, and all that was really necessary to, to be able to do something as different as, as we did. Um, then when we started building Eve Park, again, if you, if you listen to these last couple of talks, 
Um, the building sector is a, is a part of the climate change problem. But in Ontario, with the grid as clean as it is, it's, it's actually a smaller part than transportation. So in Eve Park, we came up with a concept, we've got to do something about that. So we looked at, first of all, we want to get people out of cars if we can. Um, and we came up with some ideas that haven't crystallized yet about uh, using uh, mass transit and creating an electric uh, charging system for an electric bus system. We also worked with some universities to develop a, the last mile transportation system. So we have uh, a, uh, a shuttle bus, autonomous shuttle bus that was developed between us and the University of Waterloo. Um, it's ready to come to uh, West Five as soon as the regulations will allow that. Um, and then the last thing is, okay, if we can't get people out of a car, let's at least put them on an electric bike or in electric vehicles. And so EVE Park, EVE actually stands for Electric Vehicle Enclave. And so we started developing, how can we do that? Um, and uh, we developed some technology to uh, pretty uniquely park cars and charge them at the same time. Um, but the real key part of the team to make that happen was the people that are actually moving there and uh, they're the real heroes because um, when we started moving people into Eve Park, it was a big mud hole. <laughs> so our, our residents had to put up with a lot and still are. We're finally putting our driveway in now. The weather's finally uh, been able to, but you know, they also are a key part of, uh, of how to do what we're doing here. Um, now the bad news, okay? I said the technology's here and it's economical. So why don't we see West Fives, Eve Parks, all over Canada, all over the world? And uh, the, the sad answer, it's, it's us. It's the human species, and we really love the status quo. And we've built systems to maintain that status quo so you can't change. So anytime you bring something different to a regulatory body, to even another private company, oh, that's different. I'm gonna charge you 25% more. Um, and so those are our biggest obstacles today. And uh, you know, I, I would always thought developing a new technology would be the most challenging. I'm not so sure now. I think changing human behavior might be the toughest problem um, that we have facing us. So that's kind of a little, I've got lots of stories I can tell you about the, the status quo. Maybe we can say that for the panel. <laughs> Thank you, Milfred, terrific. So Milfred's just gonna join us for the panel there and we will have our last panel member now. I'm very happy to introduce Mayor Morgan. And let me just do my introduction here. Right, um, Josh Morgan was elected as London's 65th mayor in 2022. Prior to that, he had served two terms as the city councillor for Ward 7. Mayor Morgan is a current member of the London Police Services Board, Western University Board of Governors, as well as boards for London Economic Development Corporation, RBC Place, and Tourism London. Mayor Morgan was budget chair when the climate emergency was declared in 2019 and was deputy mayor for the approval of the Climate Emergency Action Plan in 2022, along with many other plans and investments that support creating a more sustainable London. Welcome to Mayor Morgan. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at first, um, let, let me say thanks to uh, Karen and Milfred for uh, your comments so far. I, I actually, I, when we talked about going, I said I wanted to go last. So you could say all the hard stuff and I could uh, pick it up at the end and maybe summarize a little bit. And one of the things I, I, I think I heard at the start is, uh, you know, well, how did you get here? And um, I just want to, I just want to emphasize the importance, and he hates when I do this, of, of Jay Stanford to the City of London. I don't actually think I agreed to come here today, but somehow Jay got into my staff and in my calendar and put this uh, on, this, on the table. 
And then I got invited to a pre-meeting to talk about what we were going to talk about, and I realized that I was on a panel today uh, talking about the work that uh, the City of London is doing. But that's how Jay gets things done. He doesn't wait for you to say yes. He just moves ahead with what's important for the city and ensures that we take the actions we need to take. So let's hear it for, for Jay. I do want to talk just uh, briefly, and I know this is just a short introduction about, about some actions that we've taken recently uh, related to this. I know that there was a, a little bit about uh, my time as budget chair and deputy mayor. But I want to, I want to emphasize something that's, that's, that's pretty important that will seem small, but is actually a foothold for something much bigger. So when I had to table uh, the first um, uh, strong mayor's budget uh, under the legislation that the province brought forward, one of the things that was included in the budget was the establishment of a new reserve fund, a climate change and climate action reserve fund. Uh, and maybe we didn't put as much money in it as, as some people would have liked. We populated it with an ongoing permanent contribution um, of, uh, of a million dollars, which you know, over the next 30 years will equal 30. But having a reserve fund is actually incredibly important because once you have something, you start to add to it and you can start to grow it. And I'll say these are, these are the types of policy tools that we have when we have big challenges that will require investment that will have to be done over time. When we think about other big financial challenges that we have in the city, like tackling city debt or the infrastructure gap, the way that we did that is we established a permanent place to start to put aside money for, or we established a way that we would start to pay down debt. And then we created other policy tools to start to stack on top of that. So for example, um, with our assessment growth uh, policy. When we have excess assessment growth, it goes into debt reduction and infrastructure gap. When we just talked about the city surplus this, this uh, past week, uh, we ended up putting $14 million towards debt reduction and $7 million towards the infrastructure gap. So we didn't have that budgeted in our annual budget, but we used other policy tools. And I envision us now that we have you know, an, a fund that we know that we need to grow over time, we can start to add to it over time through a budgetary process, and we can also start to use other policy tools to populate that fund in a way that allows it to get to the places we need to get. So these are not any of the specific actions that Karen talked about, but having a specific place where you set money aside to take all of the actions, even the ones we're not contemplating we need to take yet, establishes a level of permanency to the way that we're approaching this challenge uh, as a municipality. Transportation and mobility also very important, and that's why you know this, the city is trying to combine a number of things all at once. Uh, not only are we looking at the conventional transit service in, in the city, and the current conventional transit service got a significant increase to its base, as well as 110,000 new service hours. A paratransit got another 38,000 over the course of the multi-year budget. Yes, yes, thanks to a lot of work and advocacy, of course. We're also aligning that with the work of our master mobility plan and the implementation of rapid transit because what we know is that we have to change the way that we move across the city. And so the master mobility plan will set the direction of the city for the next 25 years, integrating the work of conventional transit, rapid transit, and the other forms of mobility into our long-term planning. And the reason why I'm anxious to accelerate that and why I voted against a couple of delays that uh, the rest of council wanted to, to do is because we actually have to get that moving to a point where we have projects ready for what is a federal government investment in a permanent transit fund where applications will be able to be made in 2025 and the fund will start flowing in 2026. This is something municipalities have been asking for. We don't like the big ups and downs of massive investments in, in transit infrastructure because when everybody has to buy buses at the same time, like Milford said, everything gets more expensive. Having a permanent, established, multi-billion dollar annual fund for us to draw projects on over a time horizon allows for stability and predictability and allows us to actually execute on a 25-year transportation uh, and master mobility plan in a, in a way that allows for some stable funding. So this is really important for us to get ahead of that funding envelope and to be first into the door because the first project is not gonna be the last project, it's gonna be the first of many. And I wanna say one last thing um, before I wrap up. Um, planning and development. Um, you know, we are one of the fastest growing cities in the country and if we're going to support transit infrastructure and get more people to change their mobility choices, we're going to need to grow in the right ways. And so when we passed the London Plan, we set a foundation for inward and upward. And what I want people to realize is that that is actually working very effectively. 
We currently, today, in the city of London, have 20 high-density cranes in the sky, mainly concentrated along routes that are supplied by transit. We have 7,100, 7,100 multi-residential units under construction. The largest project is 650 units, the smallest is 36. That's just our high-density projects, all under construction at the same time in this city. The other thing we saw in the start of 2024 versus 2023 is a shift in the way that permitting is happening in the city and the way that development applications are coming in. Single family home applications and permits are down 9% year over year from the start of 2023 to the start of 2024. But everything above that, duplexes, triplexes, um, uh, townhouses, multi-residential, and high density residential is up 1,500%. The net units that we're increasing of about 530% are heavily skewed away from single family homes and into more intense forms of development across this city, which is what is going to allow us to be successful in the development of a mass mobility plan because as you intensify the city, you create more success in those primary transit corridors. You can grow more intensive forms uh, and more high capacity forms of transit that will be successful because of the way the city is growing. So, this is all to say that we have a long, long way to go, but there is a trend that is shifting and it is shifting in the right direction from a planning and development perspective, from the timing of our transportation infrastructure and for the ways that we can pull this all together while at the same time establishing permanent funding options for all the initiatives we know we'll have to pursue over the future years. And of course, to Milfred and, uh, and Richard and all of those involved in West Five, it does take visionaries to do things differently. And I know, and I remember the previous city manager talking about, you know, that we had to find a way to say yes to that sort of innovation. We had to try not to be a barrier. And, and there continues to be barriers. I remember just recently working with Richard and Milfred to talk to the Minister of Energy across the province about the way that their programs for feeding back into the grid and receiving revenues for that never contemplated, never contemplated doing that on a community-sized basis, on a neighborhood-sized basis. It was building by building by building. And so, you know, they required some changes to the way that Ontario even perceived some of its more progressive energy policies that exist to actually reward that sort of infrastructure because they just didn't contemplate this type of innovation in this way that would, rely, that would require some regulatory adjustments to be able to be successful. So I continue to be an advocate for the project, continue to support them in their advocacy to other levels of government. I look very forward to, uh, to the panel and the discussion today. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me along, Jay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mayor Morgan. And uh, Karen is joining us up here for the panel. And we're gonna get into our questions. And let's, yeah, let's go. Okay, yep, I think we're all, I think we're all settled. Everyone's ready? Excellent. So the first question is for everyone. So I'm gonna start with Karen and go down the line. And it's just your reflections on um, any positive or negative stories on climate change in the last week or so that resonated with you, something that really stood out. Sure. Um, so today, so I looked at the question and I went today to look at um, the news. Uh, Globe and Mail, there was a, a, a very um, negative story about um, a global uh, bleaching event of our coral reefs because of, of rising global te temperatures. So anything that comes out of the science world is, seems to be very pessimistic. Um, on a positive note, I got an email from a colleague um, out of Stuttgart, Germany, and uh, about, uh, it was a 25-year 25 25-year 25 retrospective of a, a transatlantic um, sub-national relationship between Stuttgart and North Virginia region, so the center of coal in the US. Um, and Guelph had been part of it for a number of years, a number of years ago. Um, and so 25 years of local governments exchanging around climate change, renewable energies, um, and, and it was academics and, and research institutions and commercial ventures and government, et cetera. So I get a lot of hope when you see these kinds of collaborations and enduring 25 years. They've been going on for 25 years. So, yeah. Thank you for that. 
Um, Mayor Morgan, same question. So in the last week or so, were there any positive or negative stories on climate change that resonated with you personally? Yes, so I, I, I took this question and then I thought um, I wanted to be a little bit creative and innovative with it. And so instead of thinking about media stories, uh, I wanted to tell a story from, um, uh, from an event I did this week. So I spend a lot of time going to um, uh, schools and talking to particularly grade five classes recently. And so uh, the story that I have is uh, actually a story that a young person um, uh, at Wilford Jury was telling me this morning about climate change. And so when you go, you ask questions, and this person, like the, the knowledge level of this young person who was talking about the green bins and how he was telling his parents that they weren't doing it right, and then how, uh, how he was asking me questions about you know, the steps that we were taking and the level of being informed, and he would, like, I was supposed to be answering the questions and this young person spoke, and so, you know, the story that he was telling about his own view and relationship with taking climate-related actions, particularly with calling out his parents uh, about the way that they were, uh, they were sorting their green bin uh, materials, you know, to me is one of those stories that, yes, we see stories in the media and we see the global events, but each and every time we hear a young person thinking that way, those stories become so powerful for me because that is the change in culture and the generational change that we are on the verge of seeing with a, a younger generation who's very in tune with this issue, realizes it is something that they will have to face and tackle. Uh, if we do not take substantive action, we will put them in a very difficult spot. And they're thinking about it each and every day and even calling out their parents. So um, that was the way I approached your question. I'm sure it was completely inappropriate to, to, to bend the question that way, but, uh, but you asked me to be on the panel, so that's the way I was gonna do it. <laughs> Very, very appropriate answer indeed, thank you, yes. Uh, Milfred. So I saw some really good news on the internet uh, just a couple days ago where climate change is a hoax, so we really don't have anything to worry about. Um, well, um, actually, I think that is part of the problem is, is there's a lot of bad information out there. And uh, um, sometimes when you're here, you know, we maybe don't see all the uh, potential impacts or the impacts that are happening now from climate change. And I can tell you that we've started to, to look at uh, projects in Nova Scotia. And I think I said earlier, we're Richard Sifton's kind of one in a million developer here in Ontario. Um, every developer we've talked to in Nova Scotia, what can we do to be like that? How do we, how do, we do that? And it took me by surprise but then I realized they're not getting their news off of the internet or anything. In the past year, they've had a record fire, they've had a record flood, and I think two hurricanes. And so they, they're, they're getting the experience, not the news or the fake news. Unfortunately, that's the way we humans are. We have to feel it before we believe it. And you know, if we're all like that, it may be too late, but fake news is, is a, ch a challenge for us. Yes, indeed, thank you for that. And I'll ask another question for everyone. And this one is, why do you think, uh, back to human behavior, Milford, why do you think that most polls show that Canadians care about climate change, but often seem unaware of what to do or don't seem uh, to know how to take action? Karen. And I think it's a, a bunch of, of reasons. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to connect the dots um, between climate and energy and your daily life. And so, you know, the work of, of London's Environment Network, et cetera, to connect those dots for people. Um, I think sometimes um, the choices just simply aren't there for them. And so important roles of, of government to provide options and choices, for instance, around personal mobility and light rail transit. So some of it, the choices simply aren't there for them. Some of those choices are out of reach for them. So I think, it's a, I think there's a variety of reasons why, yeah. Thanks very much. Mayor Morgan. Yeah, I, you know, I think people can care about something and then not take action on it because um, life gets busy. And, and sometimes 
you get caught up in all the other challenges that you have to face. I mean, I, I'm the mayor, I have four kids. I, you know, I honestly don't know how I get to where I need to go, except my calendar tells me where to go. And, and I think that, you know, it, it's very easy to forget that you can actually make a difference. When a problem seems, uh, seems large and can feel insurmountable, um, the idea that individual actions on a daily basis can actually sum up to the way to make a difference is, is very difficult, is very difficult to see, right? And I think some of the work that um, we tried to do at the city even around, um, and I know Jay focused on it today, he, and I, I'm glad you did, because you know I like that part of, uh, of the way when you talk about this, is that idea of food waste, right? And how, um, you know, small actions that you can take not only make a significant difference because of the food distribution network globally, but can actually save you money, right? Like, just not buying as much food as you need or not wasting it is there a personal action that people can hear, speak to. You can play to a little bit of self-interest about the saving money, but also see that, like, in a very clear way, me not buying too much food, you know, contributes to a decrease in global emissions because of the food distribution network and, and how big a contributor that is to food emissions. So I think being able to speak in a way that can connect it back very simply and in some cases speak to a little bit of self-interest can really bring it back. But I, I honestly think people are busy and they, they don't often see how those small individual actions um, can add up um, to, to a larger impact. Yes, indeed. Yes, Milfred. Well, I, I think there's a, <laughs> that's a very complicated uh, uh, problem, but I, I do, do think uh, that for so long, it has been, uh, you know, when I started in solar, it wasn't even a uh, industry yet. And for a big part of my career, I was begging people to sacrifice for the environment. And I think that's still in a lot of people's minds that, oh, it's, it's expensive, you know, I, I need to put food on the table. But things change, and uh, um, you know it's no longer the most expensive energy source. And in many places in the world, it's the cheapest form of energy. And that's just one example. Is te technologies have changed, and maybe that news hasn't got out to folks enough to where you know I don't really, I can't make a sacrifice, or I don't feel like making a sacrifice. And it's not necessarily a sacrifice anymore. Thank you. Yes. Um, the next question is um, for you, Mayor Morgan, and it's about local government actions. Um, so we know local government actions are key to climate change. However, tell us about the importance of provincial and federal government involvement. Yes, so federal and provincial government involvement are, are really critical to supporting the actions that, and when you say local actions, I'm gonna say local government actions um, that we could take uh, we could take here in London. Uh, because, you know, the, the, with the, the way that the Federation is set up and the fiscal relationship, you know, we have, we have a revenue challenge, right? We have more than enough things that we need to tackle at the local level because we could be so impactful, but we, not, we do not always have the resources to do that. So when you see the government put in something like a permanent transit fund that I talked about in my inter introductory remarks, creating a long-term stable source of funding that allows us to plan on a much longer time horizon for what we need, that is the type of action that can be very supportive of enabling smart and sustainable local action. And then of course, there's always the things that you can do with those actions. So you saw with the federal government's recent um, uh, announcements that they made, uh, one of the things that they, they want to tie to the permanent transit fund is if you're gonna access this fund, you're going to, you're gonna upzone some density along um, primary transit corridors, right? So, so there's some legislative tools that can be attached to the funding to, to provide a wider spread for consistent action across different cities. I'll say generally I don't like when strings are attached to things, but I do understand the priorities of other levels of government, and as they're opening up funding programs, they can help. Of course, there's a, a many regulatory um, things that can be changed at the levels of government as, as cities, we're creatures of the province, and you know, ultimately the types of things that we can and can't do sometimes are restrictive by those, uh, those legislative pieces, but, um, but the, their actions are incredibly important to the enabling and unlocking, I think, local action uh, for us as well, both you know, with their financial resources as, uh, as well as opening up regulations, and in some cases, attaching you know, some strings to, to, to things. I mean, when you think about local government being closest to the people, sometimes we feel the most 
pressure not to change. And so sometimes, you know, creating a consistent forced change on a wider area can, you know, give us a little bit of a, an ability to, to have an out. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's what I'd say. Thank you. And Karen, from your experience, how would you add to that? I would just agree. I, I, the enabling capacity for the federal and provincial government for local communities and to release the innovation and the opportunities locally is huge. I mean, I, th I think it's generally true that the federal government and provincial governments don't really get communities and local government well. I think it's changing federally. Um, they've been transferring money um, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to communities. Now you're seeing them go more directly to local government with a lot of protests from provincial governments across the country. They don't like it when the federal government goes straight and deals straight with local government. Um, but you know, I just, I don't think we've ever had, and this is more of an Ontario perspective, I don't know about other provinces, I'm not sure we've ever had a moment where all, th you know, where all th both provincial and federal are aligned to really give the lift that communities could use. And, I, and when, that, if, when and if that gets aligned and the policy, you know, the policy alignment is there and it's enabling, I think it will be such an important tipping point for uh, local governments and communities in terms of acting. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Milfred. Um, West 5 is being designed to be one of the most sustainable communities in Canada, as we've talked about earlier. Uh, your company continues to have a big role in this development. What are some of the challenges that had to be overcome in Ontario and London to make this development work? If you could say a bit more about that. Okay, so... Um... <laughs> I debated about if I wanted to be negative at all tonight, so um, I'm going to be a little bit negative. Um, so you know how I said about how humans really love the status quo? So we set up these systems to hold the status quo. And, and so what does that mean is um, if there's anything different um, and you go into, say, a regulation, a building code, and they, they can't check the box, then you go into purgatory. And I, I told you that the technology exists today and it's economical. I didn't tell you unless you have to meet certain regulatory uh, issues. And so I'll give you one example here, <laughs> but I've got a book full. Um, so we have these pretty unique parking towers in our Project Eve Park. It's like a carousel. The car parks in there, it goes up, and so you can park uh, up to 16 cars in the land space of two parking spots. Um, this is not a new technology. Um, if you ever travel in Asia, you see them all over the place. They've been there for many, many years. And what we did is we, we partnered with a Korean company to bring this over, and we wanted to add electric vehicle charging to that um, because we really see the density of electric vehicles getting larger, and that's a challenge of how you're gonna ch charge them. So that was our innovation. Um, so, um, six years later, we're still trying to get those towers certified by the regulatory body here in the province. Right now, the cost of these towers are four times what it would cost me to put that tower in the U.S., exact same tower, just because of the regulatory, because um, there wasn't a box to check. And so, there we go. And so, there's a way that we could uh, make what we're doing much cheaper without having to spend any money to provide incentives. If we could just approach some of these things that are there to hold the status quo and, and find a way to get innovation past that more quickly. So, <laughs> sorry. No, I didn't feel that was negative. No, it was good. Um, and now a question for all of you again. I'll start with Karen. Um, again, back to human behavior, but what do you think it will take for more Londoners to make climate change action a higher priority in their daily lives? I think it's probably more, you know, it's, it's gonna be what, what you're doing right now and, uh, and, and continuing to do that work 
continuing to engage its young people growing up and getting into positions where they can make change as well. Um, so I don't know that there's any sort of silver bullet for this in terms of, of changing. Um, I think as, um, as things happen in all the sectors and, and things start to shift, I mentioned the financial sector is shifting, I think all of these things are going to add up in the background. Um, and it's all working towards, I think, a tipping point where you will start to see things escalate and accelerate. Um, and so th that can be hard to see, and, and you need to have a lot of faith that that's going to happen. Um, but that would be my message, is that you need to continue to do what you're doing to be able to get to that tipping point. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I know you talked about priorities, but anything you wanted to add about uh, making action a priority for Londoners? Um, I, sh I do. I actually, I want to I, I just touch on the answer there, because um, I, actually, I actually think the way that Londoners start to change their behaviors is when we have like the voices, like I mentioned, at Wilford Jury, young people speaking up larger. I, I want to I, like, I give a, just a really quick example. I, we, we hosted the uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference here in London, and, and I got to give uh, a speech because I'm the host mayor. And I remember saying to my chief of staff, I was like, what are we going to say? And he's like, I don't know. What do you want to say? And I said, I don't know. I've been to eight of these, and I don't remember what the host mayor has ever said ever. <laughs> so there's nothing, there's nothing I'm going to say that's impactful. Um, but well, what we did out of that was uh, we had my 15-year-old daughter Ainsley speak uh, in my place. So I introduced her. She took my time on the stage. And she spoke to all these elected municipal officials. And she said, basically, I'm 15 now. The next time you all get to go to the election and to the polls, I'll be a voter. And I don't think anybody's listening to what my generation is saying. So you need to go out and talk to us in all of your communities and you need to listen to our priorities because I could tell you her priorities, she will talk about climate change way more than my mom does, right? And so if we empower that generation to have more of a stage and to call us out and to call us to action, I think that there is a compelling voice because although no one would have remembered what I said, for the whole rest of the conference, I had people coming up to me saying, your daughter's right, I don't connect with youth and her age group in my community. I've got to find a way to do that like in the next little while. So I think we actually can elevate some non-traditional voices uh, who I think can create a different way of thinking about this. And I think young people is one of the ways that we can really, you know, put a shock into the system um, to say, we really have to start thinking about this differently and pay attention. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. And Milfred, what do you think it'll take for Londoners to um, make climate action a higher priority in their lives? Well, I. I I definitely agree with the mayor that the, the bright spot in, in all this is uh, our young folks. And uh, that's why uh, I love to work with universities. Um, the passion, the creativity. Uh, um, I don't know, in my career, we probably hired 300 or so co-op students and stuff. And it's, it's just always been a positive uh, experience. Uh, um, the other thing I think uh, that uh, what, what can build people's uh, motivation is uh, taking pride in stuff. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, toot, toot our horn here too much, but uh, West Five and Eve Park um, have gotten a lot of global recognition. Um, and I think uh, London should take pride in that. It, this wasn't a couple people. This, this like I said, was a, was a London project. And the more of that pride you can take in what you do and actually make a difference globally, you'll start to see more and more people interested in doing that. An example I'd give uh, when Germany started their big solar push, uh, first they started, uh, you could buy a share of some remote solar farm. It wasn't too successful. But then they started out offering incentives to put it on the roof of their house. And so when uh, um, Joe and Mary down the street had a solar panel on their house, then uh, John and Sue decided, you know, I need to have one of those. You know, it became a source of pride, and the program took off a huge, huge um, amount uh, just by that little tweak. Uh, so 
I think London has a lot to be proud of and what they're doing in climate change, and I think that'll just build. Thanks so much. So somehow we only have about five more minutes left. Uh, so I've just been scanning our questions so that we can get the most out of your time here. But um, OK, well, let's start here, and we'll see where we get. Um, so Karen, let's start with you. If you had to narrow it down, what would be your top two climate actions that you suggest the City of London needs to act on in the next two years? Very specific. <laughs> Very specific. Um, so I'm always cautious about this because I don't know your community and I don't know the work that you're doing. I've heard a little bit more and I've learned more this evening. But if I sort of take um, my experience of working in other communities and, you know, I'm, I'm looking for th th things that, that all of a sudden open your mind to something new and potential. And so that's why I spoke about space heating and local thermal energy and where those sources are. So, you know, assessing your own thermal energy assets and just asking the question, what could we do with these? Because no one else is going to do it for you. It's not going to happen by any, anybody outside of your community. It will be a, a local or a regional um, thing. So that's one thing. So, you know, just seeing what you can't see. Um, and at the moment. And then the other one is how do you institutionalize things um, to lead to the, to get at the status quo that Milford is talking about. And so what I'm seeing in the province is an increasing number of municipalities, and this is a controversial one, but it's, but there's so many more municipalities now that have, that are down this path, is green development standards. Um, so there's a number that are out there. Mississauga just announced they updated theirs. And there's a number of municipalities that they're in progress. And, and they've often been seen as resistance from the development industry, but I, I can't help but think they shouldn't be a, a platform for engagement of the development industry. And so that you can um, address some of the status quo issues. That's not just a status quo issue for the industry, but it's also for our municipal governments and the way that we regulate and approve and the boxes that you have to tick. So how could you how could you do that to really with the goal of getting at the status quo in both the municipal sector and the development and building sector? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent points. Um, so Mayor Morgan, how would you respond to those two potential action items for London? Um, so I'm not as familiar with the first one, so we'd have to talk about that. On, on the second one, I completely agree, and we've, we've actually provided the direction to move towards the development of our own uh, green development standards. And I would say, in, in, a, in a surprising twist, with, with, uh, with not a lot of resistance yeah. from the development community, um, uh, they're interested in London. There's this very unique opportunity that we have in that the builders and developers in this community uh, almost exclusively come from a, a long line of, of family builders um, and family development uh, companies who actually still live in, in the community, right? Um, I mean, I saw Richard the other day at the gym, right? And he, like, he's not only building here, but he lives here, right? So these types of things um, can happen when you enable. And, and I, the thing I would add too is, um, I think that there's like, like we have to find those opportunities to, to try to show that, you know, what we're asking of others that we can do ourselves as a municipality, right? And I, when I brought forward, I, I used the strong mayor powers to do this, but like when I brought forward putting all of our surface parking lots that we own up for potential RFP to transition into residential development, particularly in our downtown core, you know, We've always complained about surface parking lots in the downtown and extending temporary permits and that, but we've never actually taken action on our own surface parking lots in any meaningful way to try to partner to create what is, you know, just a flat piece of land that is used for one thing and actually transition it into capturing the air rights and producing something else. And I don't know what will happen from that, but if we don't try to innovate ourselves, how are we going to expect others to either accept change to things like development standards or try to innovate themselves, right? And yes, we do have some inspiring individuals in our community, but it could certainly go a lot further, but we have to be part of the trying new things and leading by example piece too, where we can. Thank you very much. So just a, a few minutes, well, maybe less than a, 
few minutes for parting words. Um, anyone in the audience today, something that you want to leave them with, or we are recording this, so something uh, for someone who's watching it in the future. Uh, Milford, we'll start with you. Just, yeah, any parting words that you have for the audience? Don't give up. Um, that's uh, something that, uh, you know, our team uh, really believes pretty strongly on. Um, we've overcome a lot of obstacles. Uh, uh, the, the COVID period was tragic on so many levels, but uh, um, our team never gave up building a, our first condominium project in the middle of, of COVID was, was a fun thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, you gotta have that kind of passion and, uh, and you can make individual differences. Uh, um, I guess my parting word is listen to your kids. Thank you, Mayor Morgan. Yeah, I guess, you know, the advice that I would give is, um, is in two parts. Um, one is uh, for everyone who thinks that we're not doing enough, you know, continue to, continue to challenge us and continue to say we need to take the next steps. But at the same time, if you want to inspire others to be proud of the community and get to that point of individual action, you have to create an environment where we celebrate the things that we've been successful at. And I think, although you've heard some great things about um, Eve Park and the development at West Five, I think we under-celebrate that to a tremendous degree in our community. Um, like, we're talking about a development that made CNN's top 10 list of you know, architectural and development changes that will shape the world and shape the conversation in 2024. Like this is not something that has not been noticed globally, and yet we seem to, to, to not find the right way to celebrate it and have everybody else want to be a part of it or grow it or take the individual actions to kind of be on the team that is being recognized you know, internationally here. So I, I would say continue to challenge, continue to say what we need to do more of, but find ways to celebrate to those who need to take individual actions to have them feel a part of the good things that we're doing here as well. Thank you very much. And Karen, last word to you. Well, I appreciated the mayor's um, story about the surface parking lots and the ones that you own as a city. You don't know what's gonna come out of it, but you give it a try. And and I'm sure, I'm, you know, just because I've been there, I'm sure you got backlash for that, or you know, critic, or you know, skepticism. Um, so I think it's it is um, being a little bit more open to trying some things. If they don't work, they don't work. Don't and and pivot and change. Um, so it's sort of you know not that not that giving up um, and continuing to try to innovate. Um, and waiting to see what takes and go with it, right? Um, and I do think um, we don't take enough time to celebrate. Um, and we sometimes, you know, unless it's perfect, we're not satisfied. And sometimes simple things can, uh, can be very important. And, I, and one example I'll give is, you know, about choices. You know, you hear now you've got to buy an electric vehicle. Well, Buying a more fuel-efficient car is a worthy step to take in the energy transition. Um, but sometimes it's like, well, it's not good enough unless you've got a, a fully electric car. Um, so I think not always holding ourselves to this standard that you have to be perfect before you act. Um, you can take small steps, and they're, they're worthy, and you can try some things without actually knowing where they're going to go because action changes things. Perfectly said. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, um, for being here, for sharing your thoughts, your visions, your projects, um, and your ideas with everyone here. Um, and thank you for coming for this event. Um, so we do have time. We're going to uh, wrap things up now, and we'll uh, head upstairs. So please join us in the reception area outside of Wolf Hall. And a big thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.